and welcome to High School Physics Explained and today I would like to look at the workings of a nuclear reactor and the physics principles behind it. Before we start, let's quickly review something I discussed in a previous video on nuclear fission and I encourage you to look at that because it's instrumental in our understanding of a nuclear reactor. If you remember that basically we have a uranium atom which goes fissile, that is, we have a uranium-236 atom, that is the result of a uranium-235 atom, absorbing a neutron, as long as it's going at the right speed. That, of course, splits into two fissile elements. They are smaller, that releases energy, and it also releases neutrons. And those neutrons can go on and continue the process along, being again absorbed by a uranium-235 atom, and so forth. So as you can see, because we're getting more than one neutrons being released to produce further nuclear reactions, we get what we have is an exponential growth, which is, of course, what we, why we call a chain reaction. But what if I wanted to control this somehow? Well, let's first of all introduce a concept that's important here. And that is the term called the reproduction constant. It's a value that is basically the average number of neutrons available that will cause another fission event. So at the very lower level, if we have an average of one neutron being released, then we end up only getting one fissile event after each successive fissile event. We don't get an exponential growth. If we get a high value, then of course we get a runaway reaction or a chain reaction. So the maximum value generally is around 2.5, simply because we might get three, we might get two, and generally speaking, that averages out to 2.5 neutrons per event. In practice, though, a self-sustaining reaction only needs a value of one. So how do we do that? Well, what if we had some system to absorb some neutrons? Well, then we would actually able to lower this reproduction constant. And ultimately, a nuclear reactor is a system designed to maintain a self-sustained reaction. So let's have a quick look at the chain reaction by using this great little animation by the University of Colorado's FET team. And so I can have, in this case, populate my area with a large proportion of uranium-235 nuclei. If I fire a neutron into that, what's going to happen? Well, that neutron is going to be absorbed it's going to split the atom and it's going to release more neutrons which are going to therefore interact with other uranium-235 atoms like so. And that in essence is what we call a chain reaction. But if I change the proportion of uranium-235, in other words, I have more uranium-238 than I have 235, what's going to happen, it's going to be much slower because my neutron may be absorbed by my uranium-238, like in this case. If I fire another one, it's going to again be absorbed and 239, although radioactive, is not going to go fissile. But of course, eventually, if I can fire one at uranium-235, then I might get a chain reaction like so. But the rate is slower because, again, some of those neutrons will be absorbed by my uranium-238 to produce 239. In other words, the purity of my uranium sample will affect how quickly, or whether at all, fission actually takes place. So if my purity is significantly lower, so for example, I've got 100 uranium-238 and only 13 nuclei of uranium-235, again, if I fire this in this particular direction and get aim it to get my 235, you'll see fission takes place, but it actually doesn't go very far, simply because the purity is less. And that is ultimately the principle behind uranium enrichment. Enriching is really the process of increasing the number of uranium-235 atoms in a sample of uranium-235. As we saw in the animation, is that the purity of the sample will also affect how well it goes under chain reaction. Normal uranium is 99.2% of uranium-238, which is not fissile, and only 0.72% uranium-235. And as I showed you the animation, that ultimately could lead to no chain reaction taking place. 
process of enrichment increases that percentage. And generally, reactor grade uranium has a percentage of uranium-235 around 3 to 4 percent. However, highly enriched uranium, which we often refer to as weapons grade, is 90 percent uranium-235. It's pretty evident that the idea that a nuclear reactor can explode like an atomic bomb is very, very unlikely, simply because the grade of enrichment is too low for that to take place. So now let's have a look at the basis of our nuclear reactor. First thing we need to have is fuel. And so our fuel basically consists of enriched uranium. And so they're usually formed into rods. The second thing that we need is what we call a moderator. And let me explain the moderator. The moderator slows neutrons down. In many fissile events, the neutrons that are being emitted in the reaction are too fast. So they might enter the uranium-235 atom, but pass straight out the other side. They're not absorbed. They have to become what they call thermal. And so what we introduce is a moderator, a material that slows neutrons down. Now, in 75% of the reactors around the world, that moderator is simply ordinary water. That means what the water does is it slows the neutrons down. The third component is what we call control rods. Control rods don't slow my neutrons down, they absorb neutrons. They're usually made up of a material that is poisonous to neutrons. In other words, it absorbs neutrons and won't let them go. And the control rod allows us to control the rate of nuclear fission by removing the rods we increase the opportunity for neutrons to continue the fission, fission process by introducing my rods i'm absorbing neutrons taking them away from the actual uh, uranium-235 and therefore lowering the k value and by there we can actually slow the reaction or even completely stop it down and one of the most common safety features in a nuclear reactor is simply a device that throws the rods down straight into the core, which stops the reaction in its tracks. So there you have it. You have your rods and your fuel and your moderator. But we need more than that. So here are my rods, my fuel and my moderator. And of course, my moderator is getting hot as I control the rods going in and out. But we want to utilize the heat that is actually generated in this core. And so what we now introduce is what we call a heat exchange. So what we now is have a separate reservoir where we have the ability to cool, in this case, our water or our moderator. Now, again, we want to utilize that heat. And so we now introduce a separate circuit of water. And what is happening here is, is that the heat that is being taken from the core is now transferred into a separate device. Now, this heat causes this water to be superheated and it will be obviously under high pressure and it will drive a turbine. Now, that turbine in result will turn the axle or the rotor of a generator and that generator will turn as a result. And of course, what happens then is it produces electricity. And so there you have the basics of a nuclear reactor. We have heat generated, heat transferred over here, driving the turbine, driving a generator, which of course, by Faraday's law, will and allow us to generate electricity. The thing is, where is the process that allows this water to cool as well? And so where we then have is the stack. And basically water is passed through cooling towers. And so when you see this stack of a nuclear reactor, what you're seeing is simply the water heat left to cool off and steam is what comes over the top. What you'll also notice is that there's a large dome here across my reactor. And that dome houses the reactor core and protects it from the external environment. It's usually very thick, made of reinforced concrete and is able to absorb high, uh, any gamma radiation that is given off here. And it is, in essence, a safety feature. So if the reactor does fail, then the dome stop it escaping into the environment. 
So they, that is the basics of a nuclear reactor. It's basically a glorified version of producing heated water to drive turbines and thereby producing electricity. Now that's a very simplistic version of a nuclear reactor. And if you were to Google a few diagrams of nuclear reactors, you'll notice there are quite a few variations on the nuclear reactor theme. So this is very similar to the diagram I've just discussed. But there are other versions as well. So for, in this case, we have a what we call a fast re a reactor. And in this case, sodium, liquid sodium, is actually used to cool the core down. Again, we see we have the heat exchange. We have a double system here. And again, the process, again, is the idea of driving turbines. So although there are differences between different reactor types, in essence, they are using the same principle, using the fission reaction to generate heat, to generate steam or water, and therefore, thereby driving turbines and driving the generators to produce electricity. So there it is. There's the basics of the nuclear reactor. I hope that has helped you. Please consider sharing, subscribing and liking my videos. And if you're able to, please support the channel. As little as a dollar is greatly appreciated and will help me continue to produce more great videos. I'm Paul from High School Physics Explained. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.